What's right, up, guys? Everybody. We're back. We're here talking about the weekly stats as some interesting news has been going on in the background, which we will not talk about because it sounds like the internet's got its hand on Hivestorm, unfortunately. I mean, fortunately, unfortunately. That's, you know, to be expected. It seems like that, that happens a lot. Yeah, the leaky sieve of GW's operational security uh, never fails to amaze. Yeah, well, you know, exciting times uh, just around the corner. I'm sure before too long, we'll all be playing third edition together. Um, yeah, at the right very least we... at the New York Open, you know, we'll be I'll be making sure that everyone plays on the October. Hopefully the rules come out, you know, before October 26th. Otherwise, we're going to have to do day one, kill team version two and then kill team three as we switch over into top eight. Even if it comes out at the very beginning of October, it's still like, you know, it's it seems like it takes like at least two weeks to churn up like new things showing up. Like whenever there's a new box, the stats kind of like make it into the mainstream like two weeks later. So yeah, it, it, yeah. this is still like super duper the beginning of third edition at the New York yeah. Open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as, you know, the stats go for this week, we do have a little call out to Space Marine 2 with three players grabbing the Space Marines and doing OK with them. Of those three players that pull, get pulled up in the stats, one of those is the league game. And if I remove it, the stats actually disappear because we need a sample size of three. So. This the seventy something percent mirage is uh will fade into non existence very quickly. But someone went three zero and someone went two one, so good job to those those players. Now I'm curious, was that league a compendium league? The league doesn't actually have a score, so it, there's actually no games played in that league yet. So it's a three zero and a two one. The two one lost the first round and the won the next two rounds, but the. The other one was an Argentinian tournament that does look like a compendium tournament. So the fact that Space Marines won a compendium tournament kind of blows my mind a little bit. But there was a period of time where Death Watch, with their preponderance of AP2 guns, did absolutely slap the crap out of some compendium tournaments. So out there in Argentina, good job, Franco. Yeah. Yeah, um, at the time of recording, we're like 30 minutes away from Space Marine 2 coming out, so I'm I'm assuming Travis and I are going to team up and slay some Tyranids relatively soon. Oh yeah, I cannot wait. Uh, that's the only thing that everyone at my weekly tournament was talking about. Or the, not weekly, monthly tournament. So we just had our Brooklyn Monthly that happens first Saturday of every month. And if I remember correctly, first place went to... Wormblade? So, let's see if that showed up in here. Wormblade. Oh yeah, Wormblade. Jeff C. at the Beast Rat September Monthly. The only 3-0 record of the weekend. Because there was one major GT this weekend. And the highest win rate faction at that GT was 57% with Felgor Ravagers. Did not take the tournament. I think the actual winner of the tournament, if I remember correctly, oh, which I don't, because I actually do not remember the tournament correctly, uh, was Novitiates with a 7-0 record from Tom R. Making his way to the World Championships of Warhammer, unless he cannot pay for a ticket. But I do think that, if I remember correctly, Turning Point Tactics Ryan Slater did put an extra ticket fee to help fund the golden ticket for the person who would win this tournament. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great idea. Yeah, I think for some of the bigger tentpole tournaments, having a little bit of a cash prize or some sort of help is nice. But there's no money to be made in tournaments, so I get why a lot of players just aren't for it. As far as, you know, that tournament goes, second place was Brood Brothers, losing once in the fourth round, and then third place was Nemesis Claw, tying in the fourth round and losing in the fifth round. So, good job to those guys. Pretty interesting top three. Novitiates. Season one, still kicking around. Brood Brothers and Nemesis Claw, all from season three, and very popular. And fourth place, the dastardly veteran guardsman out there at the Turning Point Tactics Golden Ticket event. And a team that everyone says isn't good anymore, but keeps doing really well in the win rate, blooded in fifth place with a loss and a tie. Yeah, blooded. Sick. <clears throat> this week, overall, yeah. um, we had a huge spike in the popularity of the Compendium, which makes sense because Compendium is about to go away and a lot of people have been talking and thinking about that. So it doesn't surprise me that they just skyrocketed in popularity um, and really showed off their 
the capabilities of the compendium with this very low win rate. Yeah, I mean, Scout Squad still doing pretty well. Uh, Felgor Ravagers doing okay. Pathfinders, Phobo Strike Team, Novitiates all with pretty good results. So pretty pretty interesting weekend. Some some big losers. Hernkin Jaeger down there all the way down again. That's the so, lowest. Yeah, they just getting smacked around. I know, it's crazy because they were doing pretty well for a while. And then this week, I think it's just pretty much like <laughs> it's like a field of red looking across the win rate. But there was one bright spot with a 3-0 finish in Poland, it looks like, uh, at an 18-round tournament. Basically, you know, 3-0, yeah, from drop zone, uh, on Matt, from uh, right behind Mateusz on Hearthkin Salvagers. So it does look like the dwarves are really slapping people around out there in Poland. Good job, Mateusz and Bartos. Nice. Um, also amusing to note, the only red bar that is like red because it's above 60% is the Space Marines that we mentioned at the beginning. And there's no one else that's like breaking the game with being oppressively win rate being super high. I think that I pulled these stats right before the Turning Point Tactics guys shoved in their Novitiates record. So I think with the Novitiates, they'd be at a 72 because they had a 7 record. They're, so I think Novitiates would be at 32. Uh, it's seven zero on one person, and everyone else did like about fifty fifty. So I think with one yes, sample size of seven, it would push it up quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. So would that put what is their what does that make their like overall percentage? For their novitiates? overall on here is about seventy seventy two. So novitiates and space marines this week doing pretty well. However, as far as looking at teams that have good sample sizes, Nemesis Claw remain a nemesis. You know. Pushing people around, they've got the highest play rate, but and still doing you know reasonably well at a fifty some odd percent, fifty two point eight percent, still doing pretty good with a four zero four three zero one three zeros three zeros three zero ones, and then pretty good results at the Turning Point Tactics Golden Ticket Tournament. So Nemesis Claw definitely where it's going, and if all of those theoretical changes that have been previewed by Warcom and the preview stream are to be believed and space marines really going to have a little bit of a lease on life because ballistic skill shooting is not reduced during overwatch phase yeah plus counteracts getting you so much more mileage yeah because now be nemesis clock will get the benefit of i assume having the delay and being able to shoot in extra phases at full power like counteract is all the more reason to go full engage just throwing that <laughs> out there yeah yeah, as far um, as other big sample sizes, we've got huge unknown. Amount of unknown. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. It's probably so just is compendium that just, stuff. Yeah, that... like compendium stuff that for some reason didn't go in with compendium. Which I guess yeah, if you I put those so. together, you still get like a sub 40 probably. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other higher win rates or some of the bigger sample sizes, Brew Brothers still with a pretty good sample size, a couple three O's. Nothing too crazy. Mandrakes, a team that everyone was worried about for a while, struggling at the at the finale line. So looking at the Mandrakes, we have four different players right at the final game, all with losses. Yeah, they really are just uh, walking the same path as the Void Dancer troop. And it looks like one of those was the French finale top cut. The final game was Mandrakes versus Exaction Squad. And Tibaud, the one of the guys from the World Championship last year that I played against, took the win. So is the secret to fighting Mandrakes a, just a bunch of dudes with handcuffs? If you cuff the demon, does he does he go to jail or does he disappear back into Kamara? You know, they've got magic handcuffs. If you try to handcuff him, he's just like, oh no, I can't teleport anymore. I'm not a shadow demon anymore. Yeah, conceptually, I think it does kind of make sense somewhat because Exaction Squad with their Phosphor Lumens turn off the Mandrakes rerolls. And part of the reason why the Mandrakes are so good is because they get rerolls where many of the elf teams like don't. So being able to reliably actually get three or four hits or go first and actually strike in, in time makes sense. But if you're fighting a dude with a shield, you could go first all you want. He doesn't care. Plus, like, yeah, I mean, like, the shield guys in general are kind of, like, the strength and the weakness of the team, because it really is just a wild card for everybody, so other yeah. players, like, don't want to, to like, fight them, so, like, the, the trick revolves around still being able to do everything you need to do to score, while also just, like, choking people up with these shield guys that, like, nobody wants to fight first. 
Yeah, and the fun thing with the shields is you could charge in and not start a fight, and then your opponent, your Mandrake opponent is like, well, I'm not going to fall back, so I guess I'm going to start the fight, and then now you get to go first and parry anyway, so you don't actually have to start the fight, or you can force them to burn the ploy and do all that stuff, so conceptually, pretty interesting matchup. The Exaction Squad record, uh, he tied against Gellerpox in the first round, and then let's see what he did in the second round, because this is basically the top cut for the French region because they have the french regional ladder that they were talking about i think when cedric was on here he was talking about how they have their own ladder and this was like the capstone last year they had a couple they had three players this year i assume they're gonna have at least three players and the second round tib oh man he played against galapox twice tying the first round and winning the second round yeah, and then Galapox beating mandrakes in the last popularity. round you telling me there's there's a chance that the exaction squad are still going to be in at the end of the day? Yeah. Um, well, here's to hoping that the exaction squad show up at the world championships and make a splash because that would be very amusing. And when is the world championships again? It'll be the middle of November, so approximately about so that's, two. That's going to be third two, edition two months and a week sure. from now. Yeah. Oh yeah. If they're it's going to start running up. things. I think the big, the big uh, weather vein is going to be whether or not things come out ahead of time for because w- they mentioned October, so we're hoping that you know by the end of October for my tournament that I can run it for the New York Open. If the thing comes out early enough, there is one more October tournament that is a GW tournament, and that's kind of what I'm looking to see because Tampa is coming up, and Tampa will be in between the beginning of October and my tournament. So if Tampa ends up being on the new edition, then I'm for sure going to be on the new edition. But there's no way for me to know until GW announces it, basically. You know what? I just noticed Blades of Cain in this week's stats. R.I.P. Oh, yeah. Jeez, what is that? Is that sub 10%? No, they're at 26%, right next to the Hernkin. Oh, so I don't know why little, it looks so much there's worse. There's a little extra bump, uh, probably after yeah, that, weird. turning point tactics stuff submitted. Oh, that might be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just a just a miserable weekend, you know. One person won one game, another guy played four rounds, lost three of them. One person is one and two. There is a four zero from a person who dropped and never played, so that's probably bringing them down overall. But overall, yeah, rough, rough, rough time for them. Hopefully, new edition gives them a little bit of a boost. I'm really hoping for something cool because I really like the team. It's just they're not they're not that great because you're playing boy dancers without an involve. <laughs> For as much of the cool stuff as you could do, the fact that you don't have an involve means you do need to just hit your opponent incredibly hard, and that's not always possible. The fact that, I mean, like, <coughs> the the Banshees, every single one of them having power swords is actually kind of insane. So, I don't know. I still have that, like, in the back of my head. I'm like, I want to noodle around with full Banshees more. Yeah, I really want to play Blades of Cain a little bit more in the new edition. Hopefully I get a couple more... I carve out a little bit of more time in my life so I can play some more games because Blades of Cain are definitely one of those teams that I played a couple times and I was like, man, this team is really fun. It's just they're not they're not great. Yeah, they are <laughs> they're not fun. But they're not great. Yeah, fully agreed. Uh, yeah. Any other big things we want to talk about today as far as the stats go? I mean, there's a couple other standouts. Mandrakes didn't do as well as people say. Gellerpox, you know, without the two big players on them, not overperforming whatsoever. We've got Pathfinders and Phobos doing pretty well around the 58% mark. Take a look at the Phobos, perhaps. Nothing too crazy on Phobos. Everyone losing, you know, middle of the round. Ooh, there was a golden ticket in Florida. Where Ben C of Kill Team Casuals, Battle Brother Ben, took the win in the final round against Pathfinders. Good job, Ben. What was Ben playing? Ben was playing Nemesis Claw. So Nemesis Claw versus Pathfinders, taking the win by four points in the finals. Nice. Yeah, I wonder what happened with uh, Dawson. So Dawson, I think... Dawson was the one that went to the World Championships last year for them. He got, I think, second place at... Tampa given and basically lost to Adrian. So curious to see how that game went. Maybe we can have Ben on here at some point to talk about Nemesis Claw because he's been repping as far as content creators go, he's been repping the legionary Nemesis Claw for quite a bit at this point. Yeah, seems like for most of the edition. Yeah. 
All right, Corsair Void, Corsair Void's Guard, pretty low. Far Soccer Kinban, very low. Probably the, not too many surprises. Oh, but there was a standout in the Far Soccer Kinban. There was the Grill Team Part Two, which is a Philadelphia tournament where they do a potluck and they play Kill Team, and Far Soccer Kinban took it three zero in an eight person tournament. So it's not like a crazy, crazy result, but still deserves to be called out. That maybe there's still some chances out there. For a for a Kinban player, I'm personally hoping that they bring them back to a position that makes sense for the next edition. I think if their identity as cheesing points is maintained in the new edition and the objectives that we've seen so far, like three objectives means that if you've got some GA2 and you just cheese your opponent's points, like maybe you could do it a couple turns and suddenly your opponent has no more points left to give up. <laughs> If that's a thing yeah. that Kroot are still allowed to do. Like, oh, I'm going to start the turn J2 onto two, or two of your objectives. Take the middle one because but we control it. And take your opponent's one because you can just steal it. That would be pretty funny. Yeah, also, like, with the group activation stat going away completely, like, we're... I mean, I'm assuming that's going to show up as random, like, faction abilities. I don't know, maybe a data shoot ability? Like, maybe that will be the ability on the... Um, yeah, like, I think on, that, like, the that will be trooper. my expectation. Let's see. Do they? Have... Yeah, because there's uh, the article that popped out that I haven't even looked at yet uh, at the time of recording, showing off some new stats. Uh, I guess know, I'm you know here. another thing that we can talk about here while we're hanging out with our Patreons and our YouTubers, we could talk about the classification stuff a little bit. How are we feeling about it? You know, today, you know, we didn't really have a chance to talk about it too too much. I think in the podcast. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, how are you feeling about the news about classification? Because personally, I'm, you know, I wrote on it, I wrote about it on Goonhammer, and I'm like, you know, broadly relatively positive. I'm like looking out at these kill teams like, it's probably time for a change anyways. Yeah, I'm 100% like positive. I mean, like, it's, it's easy for me to say I've got like a million teams and like Space Marines are my favorite and they're always going to be around. But like in general, I mean, like everyone is just kind of like living in the moment. So it's like the moment is saying like your favorite team might go away. That is, you know, is negative. But then like the next moment that comes is look at these cool teams that are coming up soon. Um, now we can live in the moment and be excited about that. And just for like balance and keeping things manageable and not having 20 billion teams going on, like 30 something is still just a ton. And it, it keeps the game fresh, keeps the game alive to have new teams coming in and it just doesn't make sense to have a bajillion of them yeah i'm kind of expecting that eventually I, one, one of the important things that i think it's it's easy to kind of miss is like old design space can also restrict new design space like if everything is going to eventually have creep on activation count the new teams have to be better than whatever came before it and i think i've heard about this being an issue in underworlds where they have the hex board but now every team just basically like teleports to the other side of the board or wherever it needs to go because the only way to make something new is to creep whatever came before it so having some idea of maybe we don't have to balance around these teams as much eventually is probably important over time like otherwise everything just has to always get better every time which you know people want to play with their models i get it but not everything can last forever and that sucks but that is also the only way companies stay alive <laughs> unfortunately like, magic the gathering has been doing that for forever with the rotation of like cards coming in cards going out and you can still do like casual events with whatever and like kill team's gonna be the same way because just because like something's classified doesn't mean your like weekly game night is gonna banish those like i'm i'm sure the weekly yeah, I mean, there's here. there's room for tournaments like to be just non-classified tournaments. But to be fair, this is still already this is still a year away before we're even at the position where this is going to matter. By then, we're going to have like 40 teams or something. You know, the game is going to come out with 33. We're going to get, um, I suspect, to a quarter. Maybe there will be like an Ashes of Faith release every once in a while or a White Dwarf release every once in a while. And we'll get, you know, we'll go up to like 40 and then we'll lose like 16 teams go back down to 26 for a while or like 23 go climb back up to 30 like it doesn't seem that crazy because it is a lot it is a lot for people to keep in mind because not everyone is an insane person and just happens to know the majority of the rules yeah yeah so 
stats look pretty cool. We're kind of excited about rotate. Well, we're not maybe not excited about rotation, but it's not. We're not. I think between the two of us, not broadly negative. We've got this article out here on Warcom though for our Monday listeners. Why don't we just do a live reaction? And for all the Warcom people, I'm sure you guys have the article open. Yeah, I just Force like pulled it up. Will. I looked at it. We've got. It looks like we've, we're getting some rules previews for uh, Imperium factions. Oh yeah, Death Core of Kree right up there at the front, and we're getting a change from the leader. He's it's or I assume that the Watchmaster is the new leader, and uh, basically the same thing. But ranged weapons are now getting balanced. Because they've shown a ceaseless, and ceaseless is just better than what balance is. Makes sense. Okay, yeah, take aim. Yeah, if, I, if that was ceaseless, that'd be bananas. Com beads. This is an equipment thing. Yeah, com beads. Gain the saturate rule. And it looks like denying cover saves. So, you know, effectively no cover, it sounds like. Ooh. The when you... Oh, Confidant or Watchmaster issues the order. Oh, you can get a different set of beads. Hmm. Pretty neat. Oh, you can receive... Oh, you can pick one dude to get a special order. Kind of neat. And we've got the noble spotter. Looks like seek light stops a uh, light cover. So kind of basically the same rule it has right now, but it only costs one action point now. Wait, seek light. Seek, oh, so oh, and it removes obscurity. Oh, damn. Oh, that's that's actually pretty cool. So you select one enemy operative visible to this operative once during this turning point when a friendly death core operative within three. So you don't chain activate them anymore. And the buddy still needs to be within three. I mean, that's further than where we can do right now. Right now it's within two. So is that overall actually a buff to the death core spotter, I think, compared to where we are right now on it? Because it doesn't remove obscurity in the current edition. And it only works on light terrain right now, but it costs two AP and it's within two. So this is actually kind of a buff. Son of a bitch, oh, the vet guard. The mortar barrage four attacks on four, three, five, blast two, heavy, dash only, silent. Um, I, what was that before? It was like five or six dice, but hitting on fives? Yeah, yeah something like that. I'm going to be right back, but go ahead, and keep, go ahead and keep going. I'll be right back. Yeah. Um, Kasserkin, <clears throat> skill at arms. Strategic Gambit, select a skill at arms for friendly Kassarkin operatives to have until the ready step of the next strategy phase. Um, one such example, light them up. Whenever a friendly Kassarkin operative is shooting a ready enemy operative, its ranged weapons have the severe weapon rule. Um, okay, yeah. So shoot at someone that's ready, get a buff. Um, I'd have to poke around and see if I remember if, we, if we've got rules for severe for exactly what that is, but it's a buff. Sounds pretty severe. Uh, turning a normal success into a critical success. Yeah, so it's like the corn crits, basically. Um, they still have four grips for uh, equipment, looks like. One of our friendly Kassarkin operative is shooting an operative within three inches of it. Range weapons on its data card. Uh, excluding pistols, all have the accurate one weapon rule. Okay. Um, yeah, so four grips a buff to shoot within three inches. Oh man, Kasrakin finally hitting on threes. Engage from cover. Is this this is not equipment? Uh, or is this like a part of the? I don't know. What oh, it says during shooting? strategy phase. They talk about skill at arms. So is engagement oh, then... cover one of the skill at arms? Mm, it has the same color as siege warfare, and siege warfare is a strategic ploy thing. So maybe I'd have to like read maybe engage from here. cover is a. I suspect engage from cover is a strategic ploy thing and not a not an item. 
Yeah. And four grips, like, it's four grips have got to be equipment. Like, there's no way that could be something else. Yeah. And they already had four grips as equipment. Yeah. So, and they kind of have engaged. I don't know. Engage from cover is kind of poop right now in the current edition. I kind of don't expect that to change all that much. Oh, Kasserkin troopers get free smoke and stun grenades. Free grenades. That's pretty cool. And it doesn't count towards. Performing these actions using this rule doesn't count towards their action limits. Oh, so you could fire like like, two smokes or two stuns in a turn. Because it says if you also select those grenades from equipment. So these guys always have them. And then if you also take them, you also have those. So yeah, troopers. Yeah, if you have like an equipment smoke grenade and then also a trooper throwing a smoke grenade. If you bring a bunch of troopers, you could just like smoke the whole place up or like throw a billion stun grenades. Pretty funny. Uh, I kind of love that. I'm hoping that, like, if, like, Phobos troopers had something similar, I would be pretty jazzed. Yeah, that's definitely a pretty neat way to make a trooper more relevant rather than just having it be a generic dude. And no no mention of elite points here, so I wonder if those have been done away with. Well, they do hit on threes. Threes and elite points would be a pretty big buff, but I mean, they were kind of in a, a strugglesome place for a while. Yeah, they're kind of um, in a weird spot, and it, they talk about how there are four skill at arm options, so maybe Kazakhan are kind of like a gigabuffed version of Vetguard now, just with 10 ops instead of you know 12 or 14, I assume. Yeah, I mean, Exaction Squad, you know, we just talked about how they slam dunk someone in France, so let's see what they got here. We got Repress. Each one of your blocks can do two blocks, and you go first. You get so three faction rules. Shock Malls get Repress, while Phosphor Lumens... Wait, they get three faction rules? Oh, but they don't show off the other faction rules. Dang, that sucks. Unless the Phosphor Lumens are just on all the time. Uh, let's see. Within two of it, they cannot re-roll their attack dice results yeah, this of is one. Much more, this is a much saner version, but now everybody has it. So now the whole yeah. board is just covered in a two-inch bubble of no re-rolling ones, which is pretty good. Not as good as how it is right now. Right, right now it and, is really good. And it doesn't like ruin balanced completely or ceaseless. But it still is a pretty strong effect. Yeah, it can like definitely trim out some of the problem space. Plus, that like six inch aura of the Foster Loons before was like insanity. Yeah, and now we got the new long arm of the Emperor's Law. When you do a shoot, you can select a weapon with the range X rules, excluding frag or crack, to add three inches to it. That's kind of interesting. Definitely seems like a nerf compared to what was there before. If I'm if I'm recalling which ploy this was, um, that... wasn't that the one that was like gave you full rerolls against someone or something? Or is this totally new? I mean, like adding long arm was the counter spell tactical ploy during scouting step. Oh no, 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 like... no, this is a counter. This is countering their scouting step. So. Okay. So this is like a fully a, a whole ass different, different yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, like adding three inches, so like the combat shotgun uh, close range is six nine inch inches, combat so shotgun. Jumping that to yeah. nine is a pretty big deal, actually. Mm-hmm. And we've got the gimp suit over here. The Ar- Arbides Castigator. He's got his mask. Definitely, definitely a cool looking model, but definitely a little sus. Still got a rest. It sounds like. Oh, no, no, no. Castigator's Rest. When it's within control range, if no other enemies just cannot perform fallbacks. Mm. Okay. And then a new version of a Feel No Pain. Whenever an attack die inflicts damage of three or more on a five up, subtract one to that inflicted damage. That's that's a pretty big change. It's definitely not a Feel No Pain. That's like a. It's like a. Feel most weird, of the pain. It's, yeah, it's like feel a little less pain. I kind of, I feel like this could probably be be on a four and have it feel probably a little bit closer to how the actual rule works right now. So, like, if he's hit with two bolt gun hits, for example, you would roll two dice and for each five up, subtract one damage. Yeah, I think so. Or, like, if there was, if he was hit by three, you would want to roll all three successes so that he would only take 
six damage and barely not die. Yeah, so I guess this kind of works a lot like basically this is the idea is if you do a lot of damage so on the five and six damage profiles this is substantially worse but then against everything else this is about where the feel no pain is and it's less dice so it'll take less time which is good because geller pox players do get to eat up a bunch of time just picking up dice and rolling dice oh i'll be curious to see what uh how that shakes up for geller pox yeah 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 we'll see how that goes I mean, if this is the rule that the Gellerpox get, it'll still be pretty potent, I think. One would think. Yeah. Uh, they would probably need something else to stay strong, because that would just be like another nerf. And they've already just been getting nerfed and nerfed and nerfed, and they're not like overpowered anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then we're scrolling down to our boy, the Imperial Navy Breachers, the beleaguered forces of the Breachers, who have not been doing very well towards the end of this edition. Still getting to keep what I assume is breach and clear. Once per turning point, when a ready, friendly Imperial Navy breacher is activated, you can use this rule. If you do, select one other friendly breacher, operative, visible, and, and within three. When the first friendly is expended, you can activate the other. So yeah, it is pretty much the same thing. It is like group activation, but as like a faction ability. Um, once per turning point, which is the same as it was before. Yep. And then the things that they've previewed, combat stims and deckhand. Oh man, deckhand. That's that's quite the change. Basically allowing you to operate a hatchway while you are charging, which is not a thing that you can normally oh, do. And it's a uh... free open hatchway. So now on In the Dark, you can pop through a door, charge onto a point, and slap someone, all with the same two APL guy. That's kind of crazy. Okay. Really setting their identity as... A team that wants to be on in the dark considering yeah that their entire what is this is this their uh yeah i guess I still that's just one, that's just one of their right. ploys that's one of their ploys I mean, <clears throat> combat stims is one of their equipment which is just ignoring injury for movement stats but not not their ballistic skill so and it doesn't give them extra wounds anymore I kind of wonder if they're just going to bake in. Like, they didn't show it here, but the Endurant is at 10 wounds. I kind of wonder if they're just going to bake them in as 8-wound operatives. Yeah, I would, I would assume that. The Shotgun the Endurant looks on three, basically three, three. the same. But didn't, yeah. Wasn't he 4-4 four, four with the Shotgun? There's something about him that I was like... No, he, he's, he was 3-3 three, three before. It's, it's always been Relentless, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was Nothing's always Relentless. Ever... I just thought it was more damaging let's take a look i want to say it's 3-3 you think it's a 4-4 it is a 3-3 okay uh breach wall cannot select if it has an engage order and is intervening this rule has no effect if if more than one friendly is touching this space i believe that's basically the same uh but you used to be able to shield more than one so now you can only shield one. Exactly one, yeah. Overall, pretty you know, pretty fine. It, oh, but he did get a pip of damage on the crit, so instead of doing 1-1 one, one damage, he's now 1-2. Let's go. Brutal. Buffing the most annoying model on that whole team. Uh, and he can disengage. He can fall back for one less AP. Yeah, he can, he can currently do that. Ah. Uh. Nice. Well, Breachers, hopefully that gives them a little bit. I mean, we didn't really see too, too much, but it sounds like their identity is going to be pretty much, you know, the same. Very curious to see what they show, they're show. they going to show off for Novitiates over here. And I was just going to say, like, in, a, in a world with all the other group activation going away, I think Breach and Clear is, is more valuable than ever. Yeah. Novitiates... They still get their Acts of Faith whenever it is. You get number of faith equal to half the friendly operatives that haven't been incapacitated. When, so now killing them is part of the plan. That's nice. One of our friendly operatives shooting, fighting, or retaliating, or shooting at it. In the roll attack step, you can spend your faith points to use one Act of Faith. You cannot use more than one Act of Faith per sequence. And costs and effects are follows. The only one they're showing off. Intervention, you can retain one of your fails as a normal success instead of discarding it. Sure. Yeah. Seems fine. Yep. That seems pretty That's good. Something they already had. Yep. Um, We're getting uh, the new auto chastisers. You inflict one to three damage. If you do, you can use 
one act of faith for free during that sequence with a faith points cost no more than damage you inflicted from this rule. So it does sound like there's still going to be acts of faith costs. They didn't show that in this, but the auto chastisers, by my mind, imply that if you can take one, two, three damage. And then if you are shooting oh. against, so this is Ardent looks like it's going to be a strat ploy. One of our friendly is shooting against, fighting against, or retaliating against an expended operative. That weapons gain punishing. So that is a failed to a success if they have any crits. So the current daka 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 wording. And you want to hit people who've already gone. So that's a interesting way to use a 10 operative team because I assume this is still a 10 operative team. So spending operatives to go doink things I've already finished and doing it more reliably might not be the best choice. Ooh, but Novitiates down to hitting on fours. Ooh, that's huge. That is huge. That one is huge. Well, I mean, if they're going to be upgrading a bunch of stuff for free with the couple of previews that we've seen already, that's totally fine. I think they're still going to hit pretty hard. Yeah, and the Cup Girl got a little bit of a nerf as well. So once per turning point, when you perform a mission action that requires you to control an objective or mission marker, you gain faith points equal to the turning point number. So gone are the days where you could gain an extra three points every turn by just having the Pranata sit there. You do gain more at the end if you can keep her alive, but at the beginning, she's not going to do as much. I think that kind of balances out because now you're going to start with more faith, point, faith points up front. So keeping the Cup Girl probably still just as important as it's always been. And it looks like the last one on the Imperial docket, the Inquisitorial agents still able to requisition from all six that they were able to requisition for. So I wonder if that means that the Tempestus Scion is still go is going to do something different from the Kasserkin. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. Um, and that's specifically not the new Aqu uh, Tempestor Aqualons. Yeah, kind of crazy. Um, looking at it, okay, well, there's so many more words. Uh, you cannot use poise associated with the requisitions. Note that with the new faction keyword, requisition operatives can interact with rules. Yep. Requisition vox. Oh, this is basically just explaining how this works. So explaining in depth that whatever you requisition becomes part of your team and all of their abilities now work cross Cross faction, which makes sense. Yeah, this is like the same as how it was. Um, looking at one of their <clears throat> equipment options, the servo skull. Once per turn, that's going to be really friendly, good. Yeah, agent can perform a mission action for one less AP. That is very good. Um, yeah, that's huge. And then absolute authority remains counterspell in all other all other ways. Yeah, pretty much the same as it was. The Hexorcist, you know, the crazy dude with crazy hair, you know, the doc from the future. Still got the Hexercise, basically the Phosphor Lumens of old. No re-rolling anything while you're within six inches of the crazy man with the, with the ball gag. Um, and that is not his action. That's a passive ability. Yeah, and then you can still chase in and remove someone's additional rule or unique action. Cool. Still got a shotgun, still got fists. And it looks like the last teaser, more kill teams to cover for the rest of the week, including those of the Eldar, Xenos, and the Arch Enemy, and then Space Marines. So we'll be uh, keeping an eye on this space all week because that's some um, very exciting news. Oh, and that, they're saying that that's all going to be this week. Yeah. That's got to make me feel like things are coming to a head pretty soon. I don't know exactly when the date is going to be. But if we're going to get all of these rules now, they're building up. They got to be building up, up hype for a reason. So join us next week on the podcast for more. Yes. Well, thanks for joining on. And yeah. uh, remember to like and comment and subscribe and join the Discord and chat with us. And we'll see you there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.